aboard at 2 o'clock p.m. Pacific Standard Time. And I hope you're here to join me for an educational live stream. We're going to talk about, we're going to have the beginning session on I chords. So we're going to start out simple, and over the next couple of sessions, we'll get more complex, and you'll learn a lot about the wonderful I chord. So, last time we talked a little bit about possibly changing the time, and I did a lot of investigation, and I think this time's actually the best time. If I start moving it up earlier or later, it really messes with a lot of people who are already on here and enjoying this. So, I think I'm just going to keep it at 2 o'clock. You can just set your calendar for 2 o'clock, and that's how we'll do it. So, let's see who's on here. Claudia Rivera, hello from Norway. Emily Beaton from Pennsylvania. Diane Eddy, hello. She thought it was yesterday. You know, with this coronavirus, I don't blame you. I get totally mixed up on which day of the week it is. It's just another day. Every day's another day, and it's uh, just a day. It's hard to say. It's Monday, Tuesday. Even the weekends are the same. Marilyn Rotman from Michigan. Susan, Susan Day from Newcastle, Washington. Loanna Hendricks from Missouri, Sue Matei from California, Francoise from France, uh, Bach and Knitting, I love that, from Antwerp, Belgium. I, I'd say Mozart and Knitting. Mozart makes me very happy. Fatima de Ham from, Han from Portugal, Elizabeth Nielsen from Sweden, Priscilla Lopez from Brazil, and Priscilla, don't you do some videos? I think you have a video channel. Is it you, Priscilla, that has it? I think that you do, and I have you featured on my um, as one of my featured um, YouTube on my main channel. Jackie Rickles, hello, Jackie. She's uh, skipping her nap to be here. Brenda Curtin from Massachusetts, Sylvia Earle from Cameron Park, California, Dolise from Washington, hello Dolise, Marlene Kern from Pittsburgh, Allegra Serena from uh, Italia, Ciao from Italia, Kelly Mycat from New Hampshire, Deborah Cisneros, Andy from Los Angeles, Barbara Moog Schaefer from um, Germany, Lucia Scharbach. Um, from Wisconsin, and she says she's headed out our way. Yay! Debbie Johnston, she says, Hi, I'm new to knitting and found you by chance. I immediately fell in love with you. You are an excellent teacher. Why, thank you. That makes me feel really good. Thank you. Margot, hello, Margot. Kathy Leonard from Virginia. Carolyn, Carol Cothern from Michigan. Carol Corcoran from California. David Hinsley. He's here for the I chord. Yay! I hope you like it. I've done a lot of thinking and working and trying to uh, present it in a progressive fashion that you will get. Sue M., Caitlin Joe from Iowa, Miss Nook Chili from, uh, that's Margaret in Chile. <laughs> Debbie Johnson says, I tease my husband because he says YouTube is your friend. You've made it mine. Oh, thank you. Kathleen Sullivan from North Carolina, Heather McDonald from North Carolina, Ruth Steubens from Vancouver, Sylvia Carreras from Maryland, Belinda Drabble uh, in Norway. I know you have to stay up late. I'm so sorry for that. Kathy Krakowska from Australia, Aline Mazuka from California, Mary Shell, Wisconsin. <laughs> Jackie says, yes, she is skipping her nap, but I think it's going to be worth it. Uh, Trevstar from Spain, and Trevstar has that most gorgeous sweater he, that he shared on our Facebook group, Knitting with Suzanne Bryan on Facebook. Sarah from Florida, Serena from Florida, Amber from Germany, hello Amber, Serena Burhas, oh Serena, Serene, Serena, Serena, I'll get it, I'll get it. If I don't pronounce your name right, do it phonetically like that, and I really will try to get it because, you know, my name is Suzanne, and a lot of people call me Susan, but Susan is not my name. That's a different name. That's like the difference between John and Jack. You know, they're, it's two different names. Maybe that wasn't a good example, but 
Maureen Lewicki from Albany, Luann Wright from Bakersfield, Marla France from Beach City, Texas. Is Beach City, Texas anywhere near um, Kima? My son lives near Kima. J.D. Rasmussen from West Virginia, that's Joyce. Priscilla Lopez, yes, it's her that has her channel, and I do have it as a featured channel on my main YouTube page. So if you want to go and see her YouTube videos, which I think are very good, you can find her channel right there. And Teresa Brown from Maryland, and Lesia, yes, so she says, yes, you're a very good teacher, love your videos, and your great explanations. So I'm embarking on a new adventure today. I'm still teaching myself how to use a different software. And I had planned on using a different camera for my hands, but the cord that plugs into my computer from that decided to malfunction today. So I'm going to use my phone and this is what it looks like. So you'll get a little glimpse. And unfortunately you can see the big red button down there, which I really don't like, but I think that it's going to work okay. So, I'm going to start out by just going to my hands and showing you uh, the differences in what we're going to talk about today, and then I'll show you how to do it. Okay? Oh, cool. So my son, Marla France, says Beach City is very close to Kima. My son actually lives in Clear Lake Shores. So, uh, and they moved there a year ago, and he really, really likes it there, although it's warm and humid, but he likes that. And he says it's beautiful and they live on the lake and so they're very happy there. So let's go right to this. Enough chit chat, okay? So you know an, you guys know what an I chord is, right? This is a standard I chord. Let me increase this. Okay, this happens to be a four stitch I chord. It just makes a round tube. It's actually hollow on the inside. You could run something through this if you wanted to. Uh, I made also a three stitch I chord. A couple of three, and this is another four stitch I chord because I'm going to show you different ways to cast them on and bind them off. For example, this one is the standard cast on. Down here, the standard cast on. Does my screen keep jumping? It looks like it's jumping to me and it should not be jumping. Anyway, this is the standard cast on uh, four stitches and then I just knitted I cord all the way up here and then I did the standard bind off. So it gives you kind of a blunt end here and a blunt in here. Although it doesn't look bad, it looks pretty good. Uh, this one is a three stitch I cord and I started this one, it starts at this end, I started it with one stitch and then I did a double, um, a center double increase. And then I did my stitches and then I used a, a centered double decrease to finish it off. So it gives a finished edge at either end. It comes to a point. And I'm going to show you how to do all these things, okay? So this one is a cast on. I used the cast on here was like you do for a circular doily. It's called a, uh, like a, it's a keyhole cast on or pinhole, pinhole cast on. I used the pinhole cast on. And then when I got up to this end, I just threaded the bind off yarn. I threaded the tail through the last stitches at the end. So you, again, you get a pointed start and a pointed finish. So to compare those, this is the first one. See, it's blunt on the end here. And so, and, and all of this is super, super fine details. You know, it's like, if you don't care what it looks like, do this. And each one will show differently in a different weight of yarn. If you're using big bulky yarn, these differences will be much more evident. If you're using fingering weight yarn, they will be less evident. I'm also going to demonstrate, I'm going to move right from that into adding an I-cord edge on a piece of fabric on both sides. Okay, so I'm starting this fabric. I really reduced it to the minimum. 
So you know how sometimes you're knitting and a pattern will say to slip the first stitch of the row? That's really a one stitch I-cord, knitted on I-cord. So that's what I did here. I slipped the first stitch of the row. And so you can see that slipped stitch. And then when I came back, I slipped the first stitch of this row. Actually, I didn't work it that way at all, but I worked all of the stitches on the right side and on the wrong side, I slipped the first and last stitch. And I did that for about an inch or so. And then I started slipping the first two and the last two stitches. These are the first two and the last two. So now I get this more of a rolled edge. When you have just a slipped stitch on the edge, it still lays flat they'll lay out to the edge. And this is similar what, to what you would do on a heel flap of a sock or the edge of a garment where you want to have that slip stitch. I do not use this method if I'm going to be seaming on that edge. Now when we had Catherine Lowe on here um, a couple of weeks ago, she does slip the stitch, but then she uses a three needle join. She calls it a couture join. And that is different than doing a mattress stitch. If you were going to mattress stitch the edges, you don't want to be slipping the first and last stitch. You want to work all the stitches. But sometimes this edge is going to be a finished edge. And a slip stitch will give you a nice finish on that edge. So if we look at the right side, it looks like that. So when I went up here and I added two slip stitches at each edge, a two to stitch I-cord edge, which is the same as a single stitch I-cord edge down here. You can see how the fabric got narrower because now a stitch on each side is turning to the back of the fabric to make that little I-cord edge. Do you see that? And it looks really nice. It makes a nice edge. I've even had some of my students use this on the front of their Aran cardigans when they aren't going to have a button band. They aren't going to button their cardigan. They're just going to have a smooth edge up the front. I have them use this method. It looks very nice next to a cable. Then I did that for a while. And then I did three slip stitches on each edge. And so you can see it gets even narrower. And now we have two stitches facing back. In fact, we have a tube, a whole tube going around the edge. Now, one thing, the first thing that I would think about in this, doing this, is yeah, it looks really cool on the edge, and I really kind of like that. But keep in mind that when you're slipping those stitches, you're not working them. So each one of those slip stitches has to traverse two rows. And seems like they would start pulling in, doesn't it? Well, they do. If you hold this up to the side, if you hold it sideways, see how it's curving? And I'm not holding it curved, but see how it curves there? Because these stitches are not allowing this fabric to lay flat. Does that make sense? And you can see it even sits curled. Do you see that? So what, and you, but you can see up here it's flat. Do you see up there that it's flat? So what did I do up there to make it flat? I worked a short row on this edge and this edge. What I did, and I'm going to demonstrate all of this on my needle so you can see how to do it. But I just worked the stitches over, then I slipped them back like an I-cord without this fabric and worked them again. So there is an extra row in here and you can see it it's right, right in here, right there, and you can see it over here, see, right there. That's where I worked the extra row. So this is doing the I-cord, but just with a piece of fabric in between. So I'm going to start right now, and I'm going to demonstrate um, how to do the basic I-cord from a standard long tail cast on. Now, you can do this using a circular needle. Let me make this big. You can use, let me get all my little pieces out of here. You can use a circular needle, which is what I prefer, or you can use um, double pointed needles like these. I'll start out by showing you on the double pointed needles, and then I'll show you how I do it on the cable needles, okay?
Now remember, I'm open to questions and I'll stop every once in a while and see if there's any questions. If you do have a question, put the word QUESTION in all caps right at the beginning and then state your question. So let me just take a quick perusal through here and see if there's any questions so far. You could even put a star, maybe star, star question or something like that. And it's perfectly fine with me if you guys chit chat with each other. It's just I'm not going to look through that for the questions. Also be thinking about other topics that you would like me to go through. I'm planning to do this not for a topic that will be covered in one session. I'm thinking this would work better for topics that will cover two or three sessions. Um, and I will, there will be support videos of everything I'm teaching here will be over on my other YouTube channel on Suzanne, Knitting with Suzanne Bryan. Okay, aloha from a Hawaii. Where in Hawaii, oh, Hawaii, E.T. Guero? Where do you live in Hawaii? And Ireland, Sof Grun from Ireland, Claudia from Richmond, Texas, Belinda, not jumping, not jumping. So Marlene Kern says, I like using a knit in two stitch eye cord on the selvage edge of something that won't be seamed or picked up. Yes, looks really good. But again, you, you have to be aware that it may cause less, the edge to be less stretchy. It depends on how long the piece is. If it's fairly short, it's not going to make a big difference. But the longer the edge is with the slip two stitches, the more likely it's going to pull. And hi, Sue Mills from New Zealand. She's popping in. Fatima has a question. Okay, I have two questions. I'm starting a new project that involves eye cord at cuff and scoop neckline. The garment will be knitted with merino four ply. So you're talking about an eye cord cast on and an eye cord bind off. And we'll talk about that next week. We're also going to talk about using eye cord to join fabrics. Today I'm just talking about the basic eye cord and then um, how you can use it for edging on a fabric. So um, great question. So I will keep them in mind and be sure to ask them again. So let's start I've got my yarn here, and I'm just going to cast on, um, we'll do a three-stitch I-cord. I'm just going to cast on three stitches. I'll do a four-stitch I-cord. Now, with double-pointed needles, what you would do, once you've got your four stitches, you just slide them to the other end of the needle. And then you knit them, and you always hold the working yarn to the back. It never comes to the front. And be sure not to work with the tail. Ask me how I know. Then we're just going to, the first stitch needs to be really tight. Just tight, not super, super tight, but because the yarn's traveling all the way across the back. And then just knit across. Is this big enough? Do you want it bigger? I can make it bigger. Let me make this bigger. Okay, so we're sliding it to the other end of the needle. So now the last stitched worked is over here, and we're going to work it in this direction from here to over here. So the yarn has to travel all that way. So that's why you want to make the first stitch tight. Now, in reality, if those stitches are too loose, if you tend to get a column of loose stitches right there, you can fix that later on, and I'll show you how to do it. You don't want them too loose. I'm going to do a few rows of um, continental, and then I'll throw. So now we're starting to get, we can't, just starting to pull together on the back side. We've still got our four stitches, but we can see here it's starting to pull together. We're going to slide the needle to the other end. And now I'm going to throw. I'm pulling the yarn across the back of the work. And I'm going to make that first stitch tight. And this is when I make it tight. 
right there. Second stitch. The second, third, and fourth do not need to be worked tight, just the first one. And the last stitch. Now I'm going to switch back to Continental because that's my preferred method. And I'll show you. See, I did those really too tight. I'll switch over to my cable needles after a couple more rows. And you'll see how I use the cable needles. Because I don't have all that many double pointed needles in every single size. I have a lot in really small sock sizes, but these are like Susan Bates and I've had them for 30 or 40 years, and <clears throat> but they work good. So now we're starting to get our little eye cord forming. Let's look at the other side. Yes, it's starting to form down here. See the two columns of stitches? You still get that separation right here because all those stitches are being held apart on the needle. Is this big enough? How about that? Okay, so let's switch over to, we always have the right side of the needles facing us, always. I mean the right side of the stitches. We're going to switch over to my cable needle. This is the end of my cable needle, and I'm going to knit these four stitches. Pulling the first one tight. Not too tight. You don't want to make it difficult for yourself. And as I said before, you can you can fix it later somewhat. Now, so now I can either slide these all the way across the cable to the other end of the cable needle, because you know a cable is really just a double pointed needle with a cable in the middle, right? Okay. So, I can do it that way, or this is how I really do it. This is in my real knitting, this is how I do I cords. Because I'm too lazy to slide it from one end to the other. There's my stitches. I'm just going to slide them over to this end, this, the other point. Point to point, you're not changing the stitch orientation. That way I don't have to let go of the yarn. I've always got my working yarn in my hand, tensioned. I don't have to let go of it. I don't have to reassess the situation. And I can do it much faster. I have one of those little I-cord machines too, and I'll get it out and show it to you next week. So this is making an I-cord. This is all there is to it. So you can have two stitches, three stitches, four stitches, five stitches, whatever you want. I would experiment and I'm going to actually assign you some homework this week if you want to do it. And you can try this along with me. You know, if you want to come prepared to these, it's like a class. If you want to compare prepared to the class with needles and stuff, that's great. So there we go. Now, we're ready to bind this off, okay? The way that we're going to, this is just the standard bind off, is you would use the standard bind off. We're going to put all these stitches back over here. Oops, I got the tail. Okay, I'm moving the stitches back to the left needle. I'm looking through my phone to do this, so it gives me a two-dimensional surface rather than three-dimensional. I think it's going okay. We're going to knit the first stitch as usual. I'm pulling it up tight. Knit the second stitch. Bind off the first stitch. Knit the next stitch. Bind this stitch off. Knit the next stitch. Bind the last stitch off. Now let me show you something here that makes it look tidy. Once you bind this last stitch off, I got a split stitch there. Once you bind the last stitch off, pull this working yarn up a bit.
cut it, leaving a tail a few inches long so you can weave in the ends. So you can get it on a tapestry needle, really. Okay, so now we've got those la that last stitch kind of loose and funky there, right? And this is our standard bind off. So the bind off started over here. Here's the first bind off stitch. You can see it. Let me get a pointer. I just happen to have one right here. There's the first bound off stitch. One, two, three. And we're going to pull this one around and connect it here just like you would on the top of a sock cuff or the bottom of a sweater where you've got a cast on in the round and you want to join it in the round. That's what we're going to do. So we're going to put this on a tapestry needle. And notice I pulled that last stitch. I didn't pull it through, did I? This is the last stitch and I just pulled the yarn out so that it's only one strand's coming out of that last stitch. Then I'm going to turn it over here and I'm going to carefully look and find that first stitch that was bound off and it's right here. I'm going to find both legs of it. Right there. And then I'm going to go back. I'm going to pull it out a little bit so you can see what I'm doing. So this, this yarn, this tail, is coming out of the center of this stitch. That was our last bind off stitch. And I brought it over here, even though this is very small. I brought it over here and went under these two legs. And now I'm going to take it and go back down in that stitch, but towards the inside of the I cord, not towards the outside. Okay, and then I'm going to pull on this, and what it does is it closes the circle, and it makes the um, cast on join in the round in a circle. So the stitches are going all the way around like this, and then you just take this, go down through the center. Now these are itty bitty little details. But if you're like me, I like little details. Sometimes little details make a big difference. So I'm just pulling it down through the middle of the I cord. Then I'm going to take my scissors and cut this off right up against the fabric without cutting the fabric and pull on it a little bit. That little end will disappear. So now that end is done. Now, if you get loose stitches, I've got some split stitches here. You just take this and pull on it. And usually it will line everything up. I've got that one split stitch there. Let's look at the longer piece. This is the same one I did the same way. Now, how would you tell uh, what is the bottom and the top? It's hard to say, isn't it? I would say this is the cast on edge down here. This is the cast on. And the stitches are emanating out of this and going up. And that is the bind off. Okay. Let's look at some different ways of casting on. Actually, I'm going to go to casting on and doing a piece of fabric first, okay? So we're going to um, get my yarn and my cable needle. Uh, I don't swear. What did I do with it? I lost it. Maybe it went on the floor. Here it is. All right, so we're going to cast on some stitches here. Let me make this small again. We're going to cast on some stitches. And then I'll show you the other ways of doing starting the I-cord. So now I'm going to do a piece of fabric, and I'm going to do the I-cord edge on both sides. So I'm just going to get, let's say that's two, four, five, six, 
seven, eight. We'll do nine stitches, okay? Nine. It could be any width. This could be, you know, the whole body of a sweater, but I'm just making a small piece so that you can get the idea. Now we can make it bigger again. Let me see. Dolise asked a question here. She said, let me bring this over. She says, will your I-cord lessons be including adding applied I-cord, the edges of a blanket, including turning the corners? Yep. How to make the mitered corners in I-cord. Yep. That's going to be there. That's not next week. It's probably the week after. Okay. Um, but there's a lot you can do with I-cord, including making buttonholes. Um, let's see if there's any. This is Luann Wright. She said, I used to have a toy that had four prongs that made a cord. Was that an I-cord? Yes, and I have one of those. Um, and I'm going to show it to you next week. I just, you know, my whole family's living here, which they don't normally do. And so my house is kind of a cluttered up mess right now. It's really hard for me to find anything. Their construction is almost finished. They're going to be moving back in and to their house in a couple of weeks, so I can hardly wait. So we're going to turn this to the wrong side. On the wrong side is where we're going to slip the stitches. So first of all, we're going to just do the one stitch, one column, stitch column, I-cord, okay? So we're going to slip this stitch point to point. And we're going to knit until, we're going to purl, we're on the wrong side of the fabric, we're going to purl until one stitch remains. This is why I didn't want to put very many on here. I don't want to waste your time while I'm purling across fabric, but I need to have enough to show you all the different methods. Next week I won't be using my phone and we'll have a bigger picture. I'm sorry about this today. Now we have one stitch remaining we're just going to slip it point to point with the yarn in the front. Now we turn the work. We're going to knit all of the stitches. Now there are many, many ways to slip stitches at the edge. I'm showing this way as an extension of an I-cord. Now we're going to turn the work. On the right side rows, you knit all the stitches. On the wrong side rows, you're going to slip the first and last stitch point to point. So we slip this stitch and then purl all the rest until we come to one stitch remaining. And then we will slip that stitch also point to point or purl wise when you're knitting when you're slipping something purl wise that means the yarn is in the front and you're slipping the the stitch point to point so we're going to slip it purl wise the yarn's in the front slip point to point turn the work this is the same for throwing it's not about where the yarn's coming from it's about what you're doing with the stitches on the needles I, I, to me, I don't understand how people get confused between throwing when they're watching a technique because it's what's going on between the needles and the yarn, not where the yarn's coming from. So now you can see we're getting the, we've got those two slip stitches right on the edge there. See them? And over here, we have two slip stitches. Now let's do it where we're going to slip two stitches on each edge. Okay, let's try that one. So we're going to slip two. And then purl until two stitches remain. I'm also going to show you how to do the short rows to keep the, the edge from pulling in, okay? Two stitches remain. We're going to, with the yarn in the front, because we're on the wrong side and we're purling, we're going to slip both stitches. Turn the work. Now we have those two slip stitches 
at each edge. And we're just going to knit across. Pulling the first stitch tight. Sorry, it's pulling up my yarn. Here's our last two stitches. We're just going to knit them. Now, remember how we pulled the first stitch tight up here? We can't really do that over here, but let me show you what we will do. We're turning to the wrong side. We've got our slipped stitches there. You can see them. We're going to slip the first two stitches. And then we're going to purl the next stitch, but we're going to pull the yarn tight because we want to pull it tight. This is where you pull it tight on the wrong side with that first purl stitch. I've got to move back. Uh, ignore what I just said. Okay, we needed to. We're going. Yeah, we slipped the first two. We slipped the first two. I did it correctly. I don't know what I'm thinking. Sometimes my brain just goes way off. So we slipped the first two. Then we purl, and we're pulling the first purl stitch tight. Just the first one. And then we're going to slip the last two stitches with the yarn in front. Now we're starting to get our two stitch. See, we're getting the two stitch curled edge there. I would call this a knitted on eye cord. It's not an applied eye cord. We will be doing, whoops, I'm sorry, I bumped my camera. We will be doing applied eye cord as part of this um, tutorial, but not today. We're going to do this one more over and back, and then we'll do the three stitches. And then I'll show you how to do a short row. So we're knitting all the stitches, pulling the first one tight on the right side. It's looking good. Then on the wrong side, we're going to slip the first two stitches. Purl the next stitch and pull it tight. Purl across till two stitches remain. We're going to start the three stitch now. So we'll wait till there's we'll, there are three stitches remain with the yarn in the front. We're, we're going to slip these all point to point or purl wise. That's three stitches. I'm going to turn the work and we're going to knit all the way across. Now we've got these three slipped stitches. And you could do it with four. I'm stopping at three because that's enough for you to get the idea. And we pulled that first stitch tight. We knit all the west of the way across. I split a stitch. Okay, now I'm going to turn the work. Do you like my little picture in picture? I like it. It makes it fun for me. And my hair is growing out. It's about almost a half inch long now. Isn't that cool? It's three weeks since I cut my hair. Three weeks since yesterday. I shaved my head. Okay, so now we're going to slip the first three stitches. One, two, three. Then we're going to pull the yarn tight and purl this one. See how the yarn pulled right up there? We don't want a big gap. And purl until three stitches remain. And we're going to slip the last three stitches purlwise. 
Now, this is not the only way to do this. You can also do this by slipping the stitches on the knit side, on the right side, and purling them on the wrong side. This is just how I do it. I do it the other way too, depends on what I'm doing at the moment. Uh, so this is not gospel, but it's just a way to start out by learning it. And look how cool that looks with the three stitches. Makes a really, I'm gonna do one more. But we're already starting to see how the center stitches. Do you see how it's curved up there? Because the side stitches are tighter. And I'll show you after we do this, after I make the short rows, I'll show you how to calculate this in advance. So it's not just a guesswork. You'll be able to calculate it exactly in advance. So we're going to knit these stitches, bringing the first one tight. Knit across here. To the end. Then we're going to turn the work. Bring the yarn to the front. Slip the first three stitches purlwise, point to point. Pull the yarn. See, I'm pulling on it right here. And purl. You don't want a big gap. Like if I didn't pull on the yarn, there would be that big strand there. Do you see that? I'm going to pull it up tight. That's what makes that rounded eye cord effect. And then slip the last three. So let's stop and look at this. Do you see how much narrower the fabric's getting? We started out with it wide down here. Do you see that? With when we just had the one slip stitch, because that really doesn't compromise the width of the fabric. The two slip stitches, because that stitch pulls over like that, so you're actually losing two stitches in width. The three stitch, you're actually losing two stitches on this side and two stitches on this side. So you would want to compensate for that. If you were doing this on a garment, you would want to actually cast on enough stitches to work the eye cord independently of the garment. So if your garment required, you know, like uh, 200 stitches and you wanted to do a three stitch eye cord on each side, you would cast on 206 stitches because the eye cord curls to the back of the fabric. So that's how you would compensate for the curl of it. Now let's look at how, oh, let me show you the short rows. One more, then I'll start talking about row gauge, okay? We'll save the gauge for last. So we're going to work these three stitches, pulling the first one tight. Now we're not going to continue across the fabric. Instead, we're going to slip them point to point back to the left needle. And we're going to work them again. Pulling the yarn tight. And then we'll work until the end of the needle. And then we're going to slip these three stitches back to the left needle, point to point. And we're going to work them again. So we're putting in one extra row. Then we turn the work. Slip the first three stitches. Work the next stitches. This is crucial. What I'm showing you right here, you will not see anybody else show this doing the short rows in the uh, knitted on I-cord. And you will see lots and lots of projects where the I-cord actually pulls the edge in because you're not getting the same row gauge on the I-cord as you are on the fabric. And you can see that those do not show on the front of the fabric. There is no hole. There's no hole. 
and this is my little swatch. I made the extra ones right here and here. See, it looks good. A little bit of a hole there, but you're not going to see that in your work. Now, so how do you figure out how often you need to do that? You take your uh, some I cord that you created, like if you want to have it a uh, three stitch I cord, you would do a three stitch I cord. This is a four stitch I cord. So let's say I want to do a four stitch I cord on the edge of my blanket. So I need to know how many rows of this will be equivalent to the rows of whatever the fabric is on my blanket. Let's say this is my blanket. Okay. And I want to add an I cord border to my blanket, but I don't want it to detract. I don't want it to pull the blanket in like this. So what, how do you do that? You knit a swatch in the stitch pattern that you're going to be bordering and you block it. And it needs to be the yarn and needles that you're going to use for the project and the knitter, you of course, and then you block it and you're going to measure row gauge. And you need to have enough fabric. So I have, I have five inches here of fabric. I would, this is how I count row gauge to get a really accurate row gauge. I take a needle and I put it, let me enlarge this. I have a whole set of videos on doing gauge. I would go under this stitch right here, under both legs of this stitch. And then I would put another needle, which let's see, I got a skinny needle. I do have a skinny needle. Okay, let's put another needle. I follow that column down. So that's that column. I follow that column down and I put a needle under a stitch towards this end, just under one stitch. Okay. And then I measure the distance from needle to needle and let's see what I get. That looks like, and you don't want to include the needle, just up to the needle, basically to the bottom of that V stitch and to the top of this stitch that's down here. I'm getting four and a half inches exactly. So I would write that down four and a half inches. And then I use my counter and I count the stitches in between the needles, not the ones on the needles. So I'm gonna go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, 31, 32, 33, 34. So I would divide 34 by 4.5. Does anybody have a calculator? I have one, but it's on my phone and I'm using my phone as the camera, so I can't do that. Somebody figure that out. Um, and give us the answer, and that'll tell us how many stitches to the inch we're getting in this particular stitch pattern, which happens to be stockinette. Then we would use our sample of our I cord, and we're going to do the same thing. We're going to put a needle through a stitch at the top. We're going to follow that column down to the bottom and put a needle through the bottom. And this has been blocked. This is on blocked swatches, okay? And it needs to lay resting, not stretching in any way. And then I would count, measure, and on that measurement I'm getting three and five eighths. So some, somebody's gonna do this, three and five eighths. What is three and five eighths? Five eighths is uh, 0.625, so it's gonna be 3.625 inches, okay? And let's count the stitches. I hope somebody's writing that down. One of you do that. And we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, 
13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23. 23 stitches divided by 3.625. Can somebody do that? 23 stitches divided by 3.625. Somebody do it. And then let's compare because these were done with the same size needle, the same yarn as this. And let's compare the rows. Anybody doing that? Somebody jump on it. Okay, so Francoise says uh, 44 divided by 4.5 in, and, and Emma's Nook Chili says she got 7.55 stitches per inch. Ruth Steuben's got 7.8. Diane Eddy got 7.555. So we're going to go with 7.55 stitches per inch. Do not round it. Okay, just we got 7.55. Did anybody get the... Um, Six, let's see, we got 6.3. Fatima, is that the um, Marlene Kern? 6.34. Okay, so we got 7.55 rows per inch in stockinette, and we're getting 6.34 rows per inch in the I cord. So, what do you think we need to do? We need to add one row every inch, right? Because if we put six rows of I-cord on this edge and it uses, it'll get fill up an inch. Let's see, am I doing it right? No, that's not right. Let's look at this. Yes, it is right. It takes a lot of thinking. Remember, you're only doing the I-cords every other row. Okay, so it takes two rows of the whole garment to make one row of I-cord. So we'd actually have to increase more than that. So let's say um, we would say that the I-cord, the 6.34 rows of I-cord is worked over 15 rows of stockinette. Doesn't seem right, does it? We have to think about this. We're doing this, we're slipping the stitches so they're only being worked on the right side rows. They're not being worked on the wrong side rows. For So for every seven rows of stock, for every inch of stockinette, we're getting six rows of I cord. So it might work out maybe that you need to have less rows of I cord instead of more, but I think it's going to be more. My, my brain's fuddled right now. Usually I can see this very clearly. I think that you need to have one extra row of I cord for every inch, and then it will work out correctly. Um, I'm going to try it on a bigger project. I would like you guys to do this is the homework. This is the homework, and then I'm going to go through and we'll, I'll answer some more questions. The homework is this, and write it down. I'll write it down myself and put it underneath the description of the video once it gets uh, put onto YouTube. I would like you to knit a swatch that is about, that use worsted weight yarn, okay, and a US 7 needle if you have it. And if you have a light colored yarn, that would be really good because you can see the stitches better in a light colored yarn. Let me make myself big here. What I would like you to do is to cast on maybe 15 stitches and knit it in stockinette stitch for four inches and bind it off and block it. And then with the same needles and the same yarn, I would like you to cast on four stitches and work the I cord for four inches, bind it off and block it. And then I would like you to measure the row gauge for each one and come back next week with that information. Okay, now let me show you the alternate methods that I was going to show you for casting on and binding off on the I cord now that we've talked about all of this stuff. Okay, so I'm going to go back over to the uh, little camera. By the way, it's right here, just below 
where you can see. In fact, let me see. Can you see my camera? It's right here. I guess my name's in the way. Let me move my name out of the way. There's my camera. Do you see it? My clamp. Next week I'll use my um, Elmo and it, it, it's uh, easier for me to use and you'll see a bigger picture instead of this itty bitty dinky picture, which is not what I had planned. So, okay, let me show you some alternate methods for casting on, okay? Here's my yarn. Let me break this off. Okay, the first one, and these are a little tricky, but, you know, it's kind of fun to know alternate methods, don't you think? And then I'll answer more questions. The first one is going to be like a, uh, a pinhole cast on, like what you would do for a doily. So you just start with a circle. Here's the tail right here, the end of the... So the circle needs to be on top. The tail needs to be on top. This is the tail. Okay, the tail is on the top. Then put this in your hand like you're going to tension it for casting on. Hold this where it crosses there with your thumb and your finger. Then you're going to take your needle and you pick this yarn up here. And this is not going to be a stitch, it just secures the end so you can start making stitches. Then you're going to go through the loop and make a stitch, pick up a stitch. Then you're going to go above the loop and pick up a stitch, through the loop and pick up a stitch. So we're going to have three. This is just a placekeeper. We're going to have three stitches. We're going to make a fourth one. We're just going to do a backward loop cast on to secure the end, okay? So we've got our four stitches on there. Um, then we turn, we slide these to the other end of the needle. This is so cool. I love this cast on. If you're going to use uh, four or more stitches, this works really good. For the three stitch one, I'll show you a different method. So now we're going to tension the yarn. We're going to drop that first stitch off. It means nothing, okay? We're going to knit into the second stitch, which is just now a big loop. But I'm holding it with my thumb and my finger. I'm going to knit into that. Pull it firmly across the back. It's just a big loop, and I'm going to knit into the next three stitches. And that's that backwards thumb cast on. So now we have that circle down there that we cast on into. And what you can do is you can take the tail and pull it up to nothing. Then slide your stitches to the other end of the needle. I advise going to the other end of the needle for the first couple rows and you can just slip them back and forth. The yarn's coming from this end over here, and we're going to knit, making the first stitch tight. I think the white yarn is too bright. I might use my green yarn next time. And there's the back side. So after you do a few rows, that's, that's how you started. What it looks like is... This right here. This is the cast on right here. So it just emanates from that one point. So if you wanted to bind this one off, this one, the bind off is really easy. What you're going to do is cut a tail 
we'll pretend like this is a long pie cord, but it's not. We're going to cut some yarn and put that on our tapestry needle. We're going to slide these stitches to the other end of the needle. And we're going to, so the yarn's coming from the other side. We're just going to slide the yarn through all the stitches. And we're going to pull it up. Without the tail involved. And you end up with an ending that looks just like the beginning. It comes to a nice little end. And then you just can go over the top of that. Don't go through it because you'll lose the last stitch. Go over the top of that last stitch and down through the center with your yarn. And that closes it off. Okay, so let me show you the last method that I want to show you. This works good if you have um, three stitches in your I-cord. You can start out with a uh, chain, crochet chain. I'm just making a slip knot. So you have your crochet chain. And make a chain of four or five stitches. Or six. You want enough after the slip knot to give you a couple inches of yarn. Okay, now we're going to put this on our knitting needle. And it's going to go this way. We want the correct stitch mount, like that. We're going to take our second knitting needle, wherever it may be. How can things escape when they're right in front of me? We'll use this one. Now we've got our tail down here and our working yarn here. And that's going to want to pop up like this when you pull on the yarn. So that's why I like to have a tail. I can hold it down here. We're going to make a central double increase. And I have a video just on doing this. It's called CDI or central double increase. And we're going to increase one stitch to three. So we first we knit through the back. Then knit through the front. And it's tight. It should be tight. And then you can see this little bar that comes down right here. between This stitch and this stitch. And there's a bar that comes straight down between them. Put this needle under that bar. And put it over on the left needle. And knit through that. Through the back. This gives you a really nice little increase from one to three and then you would continue on so let me show you what that looks like that's the bind off edge i'll show you how to bind it off here's the cast on so that's why it's called a central double cast on so to bind that off let me work a few stitches a few rows and then I'll show you how you bind that one off to match. And speaking of that, that would be a whole nother topic that we can do. Wouldn't that be fun to have a series of educational live streams on matching cast-ons and bind-offs? So we want the working yarn coming from the last stitch. We'll work a couple of uh, rows of this. And I'll show you what to do with that chain once you get it going. And then I just slip these back. It's easier. I have double pointed needles and I could slip them from end to end, but I find it much faster, especially when I'm sitting in my knitting chair and I'm not filming it. It's just much faster for me just to slip them point to point and then work the next row. We'll get a couple rows going so I have enough to show you how to bind this off with a matching bind off. I'm making a mess of it here.
I've got some split stitches, so just ignore that. I just want you to see the method. One more row. So if you wanted to bind this off with a matching bind off, you could do a central double decrease. And how do you do that? And guess what? I have videos on that too. So you would do slip these two stitches as if to knit together. Knit the next stitch. Slip these two stitches back over and off. You can do them one at a time or both at the same time. I do them both at the same time. So you have one stitch and that's where the yarn is attached. So again, just pull the yarn until you have a long enough tail to cut. So you just have the yarn coming out of the center of the stitch. You get your tapestry needle. Thread it on. Go over that loop. That last loop, you're going to go over it and straight down through the center of the little eye cord. And it gives you a nice finished end. Now on this end, what are you going to do with this? Well, what you've got to do is, you can use your tapestry needle, you've got to undo the chain a little bit. And you're going to have that knot at the very beginning, which will not, it interferes with pulling the yarn out. So, what I like to do with the knot is just cut it off. That's why I need enough chain there. So I'm just going to cut the knot off, because it won't pull through the other stitches. get rid of it. Then I'm just going to undo the chain. One more till I get up to that central double increase that I made. And pulling it tight, I'd put this on the tapestry needle, thread it, and go the other way through. And this is an itty bitty little thing. That's the that's the four stitch. No, that's the three stitch. That's the one I use this technique on. So you can see it comes to a nice end there, and it comes to a nice end here. And you just would thread this down through the center of the eye cord. You don't need to weave the ends in. They'll be fine. Okay, so let's see if there's some questions on here, okay? Let me go back up a little bit. It'll take me a second. Bear with me. So... Uh, Alicia Sharberth says, I don't understand how you did the short rows. I have a, there'll be a video coming out in the next day of that exact technique over on my other channel that's called Knitting with Suzanne Bryan, but there'll be a link um, up in the top corner of this video. I'll put links to the other videos. As I come to that technique in this video, I'll put a link. Also, um, Diana Danko makes the timestamps, so you can always go back below the video and see all the timestamps, and I, I'll put links to the videos in there as well. So you just click on it, it'll take you right to that video, okay? So there's going to be little short tutorials for all the different things that I showed in here. It won't be one big long tutorial. If you want to just see one little section, it'll be on there, but it'll be on Knitting with Suzanne Bryan. This channel is called Suzanne Off the Cuff, and I just do my live streams here. So Fatima says, I have two questions. A starting new project that involves eye cord. We, did, we covered that. Okay. 
can I combine? She asks also, can I combine five plies for I chord? I know, I think yeah, you can. You can do five. You can do any number. But of course, what would you do? Guess what would you do first? You would swatch and see if you like it. Okay. Question two. Okay. Luann Wright. I used to have a toy. Oh, yes. I'll show that toy next week when I find it. Great tip, point-to-point -point eye cord. Did not know about that tip. Yeah, that's what I use all the time. Dolise says, question. Well, we already covered that about putting on the edge of a blanket. Margo says, so the mystery is solved. Much easier than it appears. I have to bounce out and get back to work. Bye all. Thank you, Suzanne. Thank you, Margo. Deborah Cisneros, comment. Isn't that toy called a French knitter? I don't know what it's called. When I get mine out, it probably has a name on it. I've had it for a while. And Diana Eddy says, we called that corking. No idea why, but my brothers and I made miles of cord that way. Exactly. Well, you know, corking, I think it was because uh, before there was that plastic toy, my dad would use um, wooden thread spools, you know, when the, you used the thread all up and they were on those wooden spools and he would put nails around the top and we would use that to make eye cord, my sister and I. And or you could do uh, use a cork. Yeah, you remember the corks that had the opening that goes down in the middle for a tube, a glass tube to go through. That's probably it. My mother, remember when we had to iron clothes, and before steam irons, my mother had a water bottle she used, and it had that cork in the top, and it had a thing sticking out like uh, like with holes in it, like a salt shaker, and she would sprinkle the clothes and roll them up and let the moisture evenly saturate and then she would iron. I mean, it was a huge thing and that's what we did when we were kids. Okay, Diane, Dad made it with a wooden thread. Well, yes, exactly. Um, Marlene, question. When I knit in I-cord edges, I don't slip the stitches at both ends of each yarn. Each row, I yarn forward before the end stitches of the row and slip those stitches on each row, knit and purl. You can do it either way. As I said a little while ago, what I'm showing you is just one way. You can, and I think it's the easiest to remember if you just always slip the stitches on the purl side, on the wrong side rows, because then you don't have to rearrange any of the stitches. If you slip them on the right side rows, you're going to have to slip them as if to knit. Does that make sense? Because if you don't, you'll end up with, when you come back and purl them, you'll end up with like garter stitch. Try it. Try it on a swatch. And she says, um, she says, okay, so Marlene, how many stitches are you slipping on the edge? Is it one stitch? One stitch doesn't, isn't going to change the fabric. Here is my one stitch. Down here, just one stitch is slipped at each edge, and you can see that it is flat. It's not curling. It's when I get up here to when I'm slipping two stitches, you can start to see the curl, and especially in the three stitches. That's when it causes the fabric. When you're getting um, fewer rows per inch here, you're getting six rows per inch here, but seven here. So this is causing it to pull in because these seven are pushing out. Does that make sense? But down here where you're just doing one stitch on the edge, it lays flat. It's perfectly nice. Okay, let me see. Let's go on. Luana Hendricks, question. Would this technique work for inserting a zipper in a jacket? Yes. Yes, this would make a lovely edge up against a zipper. But remember, you might have to put some short rows in there. Marlene continued, my fabric doesn't get more narrow and it doesn't pull in. So you're probably just using the one stitch because that didn't change the width of the fabric. You can clearly see that the two stitch and the three stitch changes the width of the fabric. Elizabeth Nielsen, question, would I-cord pull in when knitting brioche? You'd have to do your gauge swatch in brioche and then your I-cord also and compare. Probably in that instance, you would probably have to do extra rows of the brioche compared to the i-cord because brioche uses a lot of rows 
Okay, Deborah Cisneros, question. What is the effect if you work the short rows on the purl side? The same. You could do it either way, except for when I'm doing the purl side, I'm slipping the stitches. I'm not working them, so it's hard to do a short row when you're slipping them. Just try it. All these things are good to try on swatches. That's why I want you to knit some swatches. The way how I learn is I sit and I knit these little swatches. You should see what I do in all the swatches that I make. David Hensley comment, the layers of technology that you use to produce these videos is astounding. If you were as creative with your patients as you are with us knitters, I bet they were glad to keep their appointments. Yeah, I, I had... I had patients who used to follow me wherever I went. Those patients went too. Diane, Eddie, okay, now we're getting into, I'm looking at the gauge that we got. Yes. Delise, if the edge is garter stitch, then we would count each ridge as two rows, right? Yes. Yep. And in, if you were doing, if, you're, if your edge is garter stitch, we're talking about I-cord here. Are you talking about garter stitch edge or garter stitch fabric with an I-cord edge? If you were doing garter stitch fabric with an I-cord edge, you would absolutely positively have to check your two gauges against each other so that you don't have, uh, you know, it's just like stitch gauge. When you go from one stitch gauge to another in a fabric, you can get flaring or not flaring. All that stuff that we talked about, about cable flare, about the stitch gauge changing, you know, the cables pull the stitches in, you have more stitches to the edge, and then you go back to stockinette and the stockinette will flare. It'll ruffle, actually, because it was pulled in so tight with the um, cable stitches. So you always have to check the gauges. I know it's more fun to just pick up your needles and start knitting. And in, if you're just knitting a pattern where all the instructions are there, that's great. What I'm trying to teach you is how to think about your knitting so that you can do whatever you want. You have control over your needles and your yarn. If you understand the mechanics behind it, and why you're doing things the way you're doing. You can make anything you want. Um, okay, question. Love your top. Did you design it or is it purchase pattern? Um, it's a purchase pattern. It's on my Ravelry page in my projects. It's super cute. It's just all garter stitch. It took one skein of fingering weight yarn and it has all these short rows up here at the top that make the sleeve caps really cute. Super, super easy. And then I did my own little treatment around the neck, which I'll show sometime. Dolly says, I'd say that you'd pick up and create six I-cord rows on the seven rows of blanket edge. No, I say you would pick up seven I-cord rows. You would pick up seven for six you would reverse it <laughs> debbie johnson says i'll keep quiet until i understand better what i want you to do is knit those two swatches the i-cord swatch and the stockinette swatch and then compare them and then try figuring out yourself how you want to put the two rows together and make a swatch like this and add your short rows if you want i'll put directions for all of this <laughs> This is good. Suzanne McVicker. I think of it like a row of children lined up and we need a second row of kids to use the buddy system. If you have six kids in second line and you need to add a child in the, at the end so they will all have a buddy. Exactly. Yeah. So, uh, yes, yes, yes. Cast on. Yes. To matching cast. The cast on some bind offs will be really fun. I'm looking forward to that. Yeah, everybody remember to hit the like button. I think you get so engrossed in watching this and seeing what's going on that you forget to hit that thumbs up. Makes me feel good when I see those. Also, be sure to subscribe to my channel. I know all of you guys are subscribed, but if there are people on here that watch who don't comment, uh, be sure that you subscribe to my channel. That helps me a lot. So, let, and this is... Uh, Ms. Nukchili, question: Are you still considering offering an online version of your knitting boot camp? Yep. And I'll talk more about that in just a second. Fatima says, "Great lesson and very cozy atmosphere." Thanks, Suzanne. Thumbs up all. Uh, we. This is Kathy. We used a Kumi Hemo disc for cords for crocheted Munchilla bags. Yes, and those are good because they don't stretch. You know, a lot of people will say use an I cord for a purse strap or something, but you know what? 
these have a lot of stretch. I don't know that you would want to use it for, but you could, you could uh, uh, felt it and then it would have less stretch. Okay. So this is a way for me to practice using this technology. Okay. I'll have a better camera for my hands next time. And it's working good. And if I use this in addition to Zoom, which I'm getting really good on that too, I'm thinking that I can do all of this plus Zoom in the same software that I'm using, and I'll be able to teach online classes. Now, I'm doing this because it's fun, and you guys all get a taste for what it's like to be in a class with me. This is exactly what I do. I use an overhead projector and I shoot my hands and I show myself and I, sh you know, we go back and forth between me and the projector. And I show lots of tips and tricks and answer questions. And I think that we could do that in a Zoom. So um, Bonnie Camp, Bonnie Davis is currently editing um, Boot Camp One and I'm fine tuning it. And it's going to take her about two weeks. So after that, I'm going to look for some guinea pigs, and I have, and I call them guinea pigs because um, I'm, I will practice on you. And it will be the people that have helped me and done participated so much with me in all of my tutorials. They will have first choice, and I'm going to take ten or fifteen students, and we'll go through the boot camp one and see how it works and I'll get feedback from them and continue fine tuning it. Um, it's gonna be either one, it's 10 sessions and we'll work it out whether we wanna do one session a week or two sessions a week. You actually need time in between each session because there is homework. And the homework sometimes is five or six swatches that need to be worked and blocked. If we do Zoom, then you can show me your work. I can look at it and I can, my eyes are very good on seeing details of knitting, even from pictures. So I think that I will be able to um, look at your work and guide you and teach you and, and um, cater to your needs as far as learning how to knit. Boot Camp One starts from casting on and I've taught I've probably had over 200 students live that I have taught live how to knit from scratch. And some of them have been knitting for 50 years and come to my class, and some of them have never held yarns and needles in their hands before. I treat them all the same. And at the beginning, that seemed like, okay, it was going to cause issues for the people who had a lot of experience. But you know what? There's so many things that I teach from the very beginning that people have never learned. And they go, oh, I never knew that. Wow, that's cool. And they leave even the very first class where we're just covering casting on and making the knit stitch. They leave feeling invigorated about their knitting. So this is the teasers. I'm going to do these and these will be teasers for you to see how I teach in person. And then if you want to take my classes, it'll be private in the Zoom classes, you'll have to pay. And I'm gonna charge $100 for a 10 week course. That's uh, $10 an hour. It's gonna be an hour long. And I will also give you a certain amount of one-on-one -on -one time with me that you can have out of class time. And I haven't figured out exactly how to do that or how much time you'll get, but you will get also an additional set amount of time to work with me one-on-one -on, -one on your knitting if you have any particular issues. The way I do my classes, like for example, the first week, this is turning into an advertisement, isn't it? But the first week I do uh, casting on a knit, and then you have your homework. The homework is a garter stitch swatch, but you do not bind it off. You just cast on and you knit every row. You come back the next week, and I look at everybody's swatches and I see what do they need? Because every time there's going to be some stuff. There's going to be some irregular stitches. There's going to be loose knitting. There's going to be tight, tight knitting. Some people, the cast on will be too tight. Some it'll be too loose. So then I review all of that and I go over it again. Then we learn how to bind off and how to purl. So then the next swatch is stockinette, 
knit two purl two ribbing and knit one purl one ribbing and seed stitch. So you have four swatches for the second week of homework because those all involve just knits and purls. And you come back, we review all of those, we correct mistakes, and I encourage people to bring their mistakes because mistakes teach everyone. If we were all perfect knitters, we would not need to do this. So people bring their mistakes, I review them, and I show you how to avoid those mistakes. And everybody gets to learn how to avoid the mistakes. And then we go on, we learn the next portion, and we go on. And it's, So it's two steps forward, one step back. Two steps forward, one step back. So, does that sound interesting? In the meantime, do your homework for next week. I'll write it up. It'll be below the video. I probably won't have it there until tomorrow. Okay, but go back to the YouTube video. It's the same link that you clicked for this. And hopefully Diana's timestamps will be down there. And then I will add the links to the video, the support videos, and I'll have the directions for the homework. You do your homework. Bring your Now, I won't be able to look at your homework, but I'll have examples to show. And I'll say, these are some issues that you might see, and this is how you correct them. And then we'll talk about applied I-cord. Next week's going to be applied I-cord. Okay? And, and then it'll probably be one more week. And then that week we'll learn how to do mitered corners and stuff like that. And buttonholes and, and so on and so forth. So let me see um, what if there's any more questions. And then be sure it's, you know, these video on this channel, the Suzanne Off the Cuff, right now I'm making about $26 a month. Okay, so YouTube videos, you don't make a whole lot of money. The way that I get paid is by subscribers and people viewing. The more subscribers I have, the more people will be viewing these live streams. And, you know, I'm, I'm sure there's going to be some other knitters that we haven't don't have in our group yet that would enjoy following along. So if you have any friends or anybody you know or any social groups, where you want to share my link to my videos, feel free to do that. That would help me immensely. Okay? So let me see if there's any other questions. If I missed a question, please restate it. Marley, Marilyn Rotman said, Great lesson. Thank you, Suzanne, for all your effort. Thank you. Fatima says, sign me up. And Suzanne McVicker says, the only downside is reversing text so the teacher can see what we're doing. Many ha have troubles and may not be able to show what they are doing. All I have to do is to be able to see your work, and I can tell what you're doing. Believe me, I have looked at so much knitting. I can see it from across the room and tell you what you're doing. And, and it's part of the class, and everybody learns. Everybody learns. Kathy Leonard says, this would be invaluable for a newbie like me. Question, is it continental? I show in continental and throw it. Um, if you knit Portuguese, um, I can show you how to do that. Whatever, however you knit, that's how you can knit and do it. I show it every way. Fatima, where do I post my question for the next week? I think it's best to do it over in the Ravelry group. And maybe Dolise can, uh, we have a question there, uh, a thread for suit questions for Suzanne's live stream. So just post it in there. This is Lily Nikki. Question, what if I knit in another style like combined continentaling? That's fine. We can do that. Don't worry about it. Yeah, I even let you knit left-handed. Don't worry about it. We'll deal with it. Okay, Kathy says, can you we post pictures of our homework in the thread? on Yes, po post pictures of your homework, and I will look at it. Okay, that would be very cool. You can post them on Facebook, too. I don't care. I look at Facebook and Ravelry just about every day. You know, I must apologize because usually I keep up every day. The last few months, you know, with my whole family living here, it's been very different. My time is different. And... I have really let the comments on YouTube and Ravelry slide, and I got back to working on them about three or four days ago, and there are literally thousands of questions that I need to answer. So I'm working through a little bit every day. I worked like two solid days on it and hardly made a dent in it. So you may be getting comments from your YouTube uh, 
comments for, to me <laughs> that seem like they're really out of date. Well, they are, but I'm replying to you, and I'm not just going to let it skip. I'm this super anal person. So, okay, I'm going to let you go. I'll post your homework tomorrow. If you don't see it, nudge me, remind me, and I will get it done. Uh, Deborah Cisneros, question, how many sections to your boot camp? Ten sections to boot camp one and ten sections to boot camp two. Normally I teach a session a week. And it's usually, it can run anywhere from an hour to two hours. I start out, it's an hour for sure. Okay, but depending on how much individual work people need or how many issues come up during the class, it can stretch up to two hours. But I take however long it needs, you know, and it's people really, really enjoy it. I should somewhere get some people to post testimonials to my classes. Um, most people, once they've taken one class from me, they will take all of my classes. Okay, so I'm going to let you go. This was fun. I learned a lot about using the second camera. I will have a better one next week so we actually have a bigger picture. I want it to fill the whole screen so you're not having to look at this little itty bitty knitting down there. And we'll we'll get going on this. I think it's going to be fun. Have a good week. See you. Oh, Saturday I'm, I'm interviewing Marie Buskey from Skeins in New Zealand and she's going to be giving us a tour of their mill. So that should be really good. That's two o'clock. Pacific Daylight, Pacific Standard Time on this Saturday, and I'll see you then. So you guys have a good day. Love you all. Happy knitting. Luann, if you missed the boot camp info, just replay the last few minutes. You can do that. Take care. Happy knitting.